Hello, everyone. I'm Nicole Wolfer with Providence Newburgh Health Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for our quarterly Mondays with Mike and Joe program. We're looking forward to talking about how Providence Newburgh supports the most vulnerable in our community in just a few moments. Before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone that we will have a Q&A session at the end of the program. If you have any questions for our guest speakers or for Mike and Joe, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Again, we'll be answering your questions at the end of the program. Now, I would like to introduce Doug Kane, who is the Executive Director for Providence Newburgh Health Foundation. Good afternoon. I'm Doug Kane. I'm the Executive Director of the Providence Newburgh Health Foundation. I wanna welcome you to our fourth quarterly program, Mondays with Mike and Joe. As the director of the foundation, our purpose is, is to connecting people to Providence to advance research, patient care, and wellness. We believe that passion is at the heart of giving. Providence Newburgh Health Foundation helps us move beyond ordinary patient care to profound excellence in all we do here at Providence. We strive to improve the lives of family and friends and contribute to the vitality of our community. As I mentioned, Mondays with Mike and Joe is a quarterly virtual series focusing on the role that Providence Newburgh Medical Center plays in our community and how caregivers are working to improve health for all who live here. In today's gathering, if you have any questions for Mike and Joe and our guests, down at the bottom of this page, you will see the Q&A feature. Click on that button and you can ask questions. So what do you say we get started? Now I'd like to introduce Mike Donahue a man who spent over 40 years as news anchor at Coin6 in Portland. Mike is also a current board member of the Providence Newburgh Health Foundation. We are grateful for his service to Providence and our community. Please welcome Mike Donahue. I am uh, excited to hear what our uh, two guests have to tell us today about what Providence do Newburgh is doing to help the most vulnerable members of our community. But first, let me introduce the guy on my left here, Joe Yoder. Joe is the chief executive officer of Providence Newburgh. Joe, the uh, news media is reporting some dire forecasts for what this latest COVID surge is going to do to the hospitals in our state. Uh, how are things at our hospital today? Hey, good to see you, Mike. Um, and thank you for asking. Uh, you know, we're doing okay today at Providence Newburgh. Today is a better day than it was last week. Uh, but to your point, exactly what I think most of our audience has heard, uh, the forecasts say that it's about to get worse and that numbers are going to increase to a point that makes um, managing our capacity in this state uh, extremely difficult. Uh, so I just want to let our audience and our community know that uh, your leaders and care team here at Providence Newburgh are doing all we can uh, to create contingency plans uh, and have surge uh, space available to care for our community when they when they come to us, uh, but understand that, that we have limitations, both from a staffing perspective and a physical bed capacity. So um, I encourage everybody out there, uh, give us some grace, be patient, uh, and more, most importantly, wash your hands, wear a mask where appropriate. Uh, if you need a vaccine or booster, please seek the resources that are out there available for you, uh, but please stay safe and, and only come to the hospital if you absolutely need to during this uh, during this brief period of time. It's gonna be a little tough, but uh, but I appreciate everybody being behind us. And as Mike mentioned, we, uh, we've got a different topic to discuss today and, and we're excited to have everybody here. Um, but I wanted to get into uh, a little bit about how we help support our vulnerable community members, uh, both from the hospital side and the medical group. Uh, and we have two really special guests here to uh, talk with us today about that. And I will let, uh, let Nicole introduce uh, Elise and Father Chris. Thanks, Joe. Uh, first, we'd like to welcome Elise Yarnell. She's a familiar name in the community, serving on City Council for Newburgh, as well as serving as the president of Community Wellness Collective, a Yamhill County nonprofit. She was also named a 2021 Community Hero by Pamplin Media Group. Professionally, Elise is the Clinical Director of Access for Providence Medical Group Yamhill Region. She oversees Providence Medical Group Internal Medicine, Family, Pediatric, and Psychiatric Clinics in Newburgh, Sherwood, and Progress Ridge. We also have joining us today, Father Chris Faber. 
Father Chris joined Providence Newburgh Medical Center as Chief Mission Officer in early 2020. Father Chris moved to Oregon from Austin, Texas, where he gained experience in leadership, board formation, and community health as the founder and staff dentist for a dental clinic and AIDS service clinic, serving more than 20 years in this comprehensive community-based HIV AIDS dental program. As an ordained Catholic priest, he serves as pastor to St. Charbel Maronite Catholic Church in Southeast Portland, in addition to serving at Providence Newburg. Nicole and uh, Father Chris, uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, from what Nicole said, you both are involved in some very important work in our community. Uh, please tell us more specifically what you do. Uh, Father Chris, lead us off. Sure. Um, great, great to be with you guys. Um, <clears throat> my role at uh, Providence Newburgh is Chief Mission Officer. And uh, Chief Mission Officer does a lot of things um, said very simply um, by an older chief executive that I knew. Um, I was told uh, by this chief executive that we stand on the shoulders of the nuns who founded these ministries. So we're kind of their placeholders in a way sometimes um, as the women religious left Providence and left it in, in our hands. Um, they've invited us to do things in new ways. So some of us lead strategic initiatives. We work in ethics. We work in community benefit and efforts like this housing effort. <clears throat> in addition to supporting our caregivers and our patients through our spiritual care programs. So it's very all-encompassing. It's a wonderful role. And Providence is just a wonderful place to be. Thank you. Elise, I know you wear many hats in the community as well as the Providence Newburgh. Give us some idea of uh, what your day is involved. Thanks for having me. Um, right now, well, for the last couple of years, um, I've been um, supporting the COVID uh, front in terms of access to vaccines and testing and um, all of our exposures throughout um, our region. Um, and so right now I'm actually in um, the director of access role and that could mean access to all types of things. So um, access to all types of healthcare. So really focusing on primary care and specialty care are in our outpatient clinics, how to get um, patients in our community um, easier access to those services, but really near and dear to my heart is how we bring services to the people. And so um, we've really started to expand that work as a medical group. Um, and really working closely with our foundation partners um, to bring care to our community. And so um, that ties in really nicely with um, the work that I do with Community Wellness Collective. And so Community Wellness Collective is a nonprofit that started back in 2018 in response to um, some severely unfortunate um, death by suicides abuse, a string of them in our community. And so we're a group of volunteers that are just really passionate about destigmatizing mental health and chemical dependency services and trying to connect people to services. And so um, really, really honored that um, my professional life, my personal life, my civic life all get to really align. Um, and we have now started offering medical and um, mental health appointments at the Newburgh shelter, which is a part of Community Wellness Collective. Um, I'm also on city council, and so I'm uh, really honored to be able to represent our um, community um, for people to have a voice locally. You're in the key spot, uh, making connections. That's really what uh, you're both involved with. Um, I want to ask for a definition to begin our conversation. We hear this term, uh, the social determinants of health. What is that? And how does it affect the care that our patients and the members of our community, um, how, it, how it affects the care that they receive? Father Chris, let me start with you. Perfect. Um, the social determinants of health are defined um, by the US government um, as conditions in the environment where people live, um, work and play um, that affects how their health functions and their quality of life and the risks that they face. Um, simple examples of social determinants of house or things like uh, of health are things like safe housing and safe transportation, um, educational opportunities, and then access to nutritious food um, and air and water. 
Um, and then just simple literacy and uh, freedom from racial discrimination and violence. You know, it, it is just very striking um, to think about, Mike, uh, that if you are born without these things, um, the deck is stacked against you. And it's not just stacked against you um, from an economic and success perspective, but your, um, your children, uh, infant mortality may increase, your own lifespan may decrease, um, your chances of um, suffering from illness more than people who were uh, uh, born and lived in a different area are less. And so Providence's um, vision for health for a better world involves um, really getting at some of those social determinants as a way to change health outcomes. And it makes sense if you think about it, right? If, if you think of a child <clears throat> that doesn't have a proper breakfast um, and that is having to walk through gun riddled streets to school um, and then is in school with substandard equipment and, and uh, supplies, um, et cetera, the chances of that child succeeding in life, we all know are low. And that's why there've been federal programs to help with things like uh, lunch at school and so forth. But more importantly, that child is just facing, from a health perspective, a, a grim picture. And the vision of Providence is that that is, um, while accepted, um, something that we should be able to do something about. And so we're in the business. It's a big chunk, Mike. I mean, it is a, it is a grand vision. But it, it, just like we had that vision to go to the moon when I was a kid, it, we had that vision and it took a long time to get there, but we eventually got there. And that's how I believe Providence is doing. You know, uh, when we think about hospitals and clinics and organizations in that space, uh, we don't often think about the social determinants of health as, as what we traditionally provide. But that's different here at Providence. And, and Elise, I'm wondering if you can talk to us about how patients are identified as needing some of these uh, additional support uh, services outside of uh, traditional medical care? Yeah, so this is something um, the team at, the, at um, PMG Newberg has become really passionate about in the last five years. Um, we were um, selected to participate in a um, grant through OHSU and CMS to really try to identify um, those patients that we um, see within our walls who may experience social determinants of health concerns, as Father Chris described. Um, when that work began, I think um, a, lot of, um, a lot of our caregivers and providers had connections in the community with different nonprofit profits, but it, um, around food support, housing support, spiritual support, but it wasn't necessarily connected to the day-to-day -day work that we, do, that we did around medical care. When we started doing that survey, um, it was called the Accountable Health Communities Grant. Um, it really, for the first time, I think, brought to light within our walls a, um, an, a proactive conversation with our patients around these concerns that have drastic impact of their medical care. And I think we all anecdotally thought that that might be the case, but there really wasn't a way other than sh coming straight out and asking a patient how is your food security this month? Um, but this questionnaire really helped guide, guide, guide the conversations with patients and give some structure for a patient to feel like this is a normal piece of your medical care to really understand your environment and how that's impacting um, your chronic conditions or an acute issue you may be having. So, um, you know, five years later, it's really inspired all the work I'm a part of, you know, like when you say yes to something that is through CMS, you don't necessarily think that that's going to inspire your entire career. But um, it really was for me that thing that really um, got me starting thinking differently and um, figure out how we can do um, do our practice differently at PMG Newburgh and then really now across the Oregon region for the medical group of really trying to understand the entire person's health. Um, rather than just um, trying to go over someone's A1C numbers for their diabetes without asking the question if they have access to nutritious food, as, as Father Chris said. So um, it's been super, super um, successful at Newburgh, and I think we still have a lot of ways, a lot, a long way to go, but we're definitely going down the right track at this point. Once you identify those patients, 
how does Providence or within your space in the clinic world, how do you go about addressing some of those social determinants of health? Well, that's always the question. You know, once you start doing screeners, uh, then what do you do when someone's positive, right? So um, you kind of, you got to be ready to actually people once you identify that people have needs. And that I would say um, is where the gap has been, not just in Newburgh, but, you know, I would venture across the nation around, we know what problems you have, but how do we connect people to those resources? And putting my other hat on for a second, that really is what birthed the community wellness collective of, you know, there's 211, there's all these amazing resources in our community, but how do we get people to those resources? And so we um, were lucky enough um, to um, receive a grant through the Austin Family Foundation to hire um, what now is for um, Better Outcomes Through Bridges, Bob Outreach Specialists, that really are those um, human connection to, for the patients that do identify as positive for social determinants of health need to connect them to a community resource in our, in our area. The other thing about rural health care that is um, tough is that we, um, our resources um, are great, but they can be more spotty, meaning um, there is currently a hot meal every day of the week for, provided through one of our um, great churches in our community, but it's not every day at one location, right? So you really do need to know the resources well, um, and that's what the outreach specialist has done really great for us and our patients is really being an expert of the resources we provide and connecting individuals to those resources. Well, of course, it really comes down to building bridges, doesn't it, to uh, these patients, to these members of our these vulnerable members of our community. Absolutely. You know, I think, uh, and Elise is underserving, you know, Providence Medical Group or PMG are, are outpatient clinics. And once they begin screening, the hearts of our caregivers are so huge that they quietly uh, amassed food to give to people who they knew didn't have food. And they personally kind of went on the line, person to person. That, that is the kind of healthcare that Providence delivers. Um, and as, as Elise mentioned, we're really trying to bridge that. One of the wonderful things about being part of a larger organization is that we're able to stay small and responsive in the local community, but rely on the large um, infrastructure that Providence has. So through some of our community benefit grants, we will specifically target areas that are in our community, programs in our community like Newburgh Fish or others who are responding to food insecurity and to fund them so that then we can refer the patients that we screen. Um, so uh, in addition to the work that Elise mentioned around houselessness that Community Wellness has collected is doing, that work is done in partnership with community partners like Providence, like um, the Community Action Program of Miami Hill County. So, I think uh, as we launched, we really have this idea of how do we be part of our community, be a catalyst when necessary, carry the water when necessary, and take a back seat when necessary. Um, but what I think this exciting work is, is the fact that we are starting to focus our efforts on asking these questions. And right now, um, even while we're doing bigger things, um, from a system perspective and a, a regional perspective that we're able to really um, start new programs. And that's one of the benefits of Providence is our caregivers and leaders and the lease is an example of that. Father Chris, you used a term that's a little confusing to um, people in the general public, people like me. Uh, you said houselessness, houselessness versus homelessness. Um, Elise, what's the difference? Well, I can share with you uh, from my perspective, you know, as I have, you know, full disclosure, I am new to um, the houseless uh, world in the last couple of years, um, don't have a ton of experience um, serving that community. But um, what I have learned from our, our Bob partners and our behavioral health leadership is really just the spectrum of those experiencing housing insecurity um, and that forever we have really termed it as homeless, when in reality there's a, there's a large spectrum um, be, of individuals that are housing insecure. And so really what does that spectrum look like? Um, it could be unsheltered, which is I think what most of us um, envision homelessness. So unsheltered meaning um, 
no form of shelter over their head at night. Um, then you may have someone that is um, living out of their car. Um, so they technically have a roof over their head, but they do not have a home to go to. And then you may have those that are couch surfing. And um, this is something that has in the last, um, you know, few years become more um, destigmatized and more um, awareness around of families that are doubled up. Um, so people that are doubled, doubled up, two families living together, um, and in their mind, they might not think that they're homeless, right? But they are houseless. They are, they do have housing insecurity, and we need to figure out solutions to support those families to have um, more secure housing. So I think it's, um, it really is to tr try to um, encapture the range of um, those that are suffering from housing insecurity, but then also provide a level of, of dignity um, to the person um, that is experiencing this insecurity at that, that point in time in their life. Can, can one of you put some numbers on this, um, of this group of people we, we are calling houseless in the Amhill County, Newburgh area? Well, we get the numbers. I just wanted to make one pitch um, that we kind of at least kind of touched on around um, our value, Providence value of dignity. For me, um, I, I was uh, first worked in, in the arena of houselessness in Texas because so many of our AIDS patients were experiencing this. And for us to care for them, we had to reach them where they were. And, and the notion that somebody has no home, you know, there's that old adage, home is where the heart is. So even if you are um, without what we consider a traditional home, the dignity of the human person says that we respect you no matter what you're experiencing. And we don't wanna label you. Um, so often people who are experiencing houseless, especially those on the street, um, will tell you that the hardest thing for them is to be, um, to have their humanity taken away. You know, my name is Mike, my name is Chris, my name is Joe, my name is Elise doesn't matter, that's not gone because I'm experiencing houselessness. So instead of becoming a, you are homeless, Mike, you are homeless, you are a person experiencing X, right? And it's a trend that we see in a lot of healthcare. Um, we try to move people away from their medical diagnosis to, you know, for example, um, in mental illness, there was a, a kind of a, a trend of calling, uh, referring to people as psychotic, you are psychotic. Whereas now in medicine, we would say, this is somebody who's experiencing psychosis right now or experiencing a psychotic break. So some of this language seems um, uh, maybe like uh, uh, politically correct, or I don't know how you would say that, but really it, it's intentional. It has a, it has a big basis in, in human dignity and treating people um, as precious, as um, important, um, as valued in God's eyes. Elise, were you going to have numbers? I think Elise has some numbers okay, to great. put this in perspective. Elise. I was buying you time, Elise. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I was just going to say that, you know, the numbers that I have um, been made familiar with. So YCAP, um, our community action program, which is um, a huge, huge resource for us um, in Yamhill County, um, they put on, on behalf of the, of the state, and then it's also a nationwide um, initiative, something called the point in time homeless count. And um, they, if you look on their website, I'm actually going to direct you to the website and maybe we could put this um, into, um, into the chat for people. I can do that. Um, you can look at the different, um, the different counts that have occurred every year. And so last year was a little difficult just due to COVID um, and identifying individuals. Um, but I participated the year before as a volunteer, and it is just a super rewarding experience to um, have conversations with those in our community that you may not come into contact with um, on your day-to-day -day, um, interactions, typically. Um, so what I do know and what I can say is that um, significantly increased in the last five years, and we really are projecting that from the the impacts of the pandemic um, on individuals, that housing really is the number one priority that we need to be um, focusing on as a community. Um, so also I will say that um, the school district um, uh, has a, an individual that is dedicated to um, houseless youth. Um, she is a huge resource 
Um, and she is a person that um, also helps um, provide, provide emergency shelter um, connections for youth. So I put that in the chat and people can take a look at the year over year. And it also gives some really good um, definitions and descriptions um, of each, uh, each group within the spectrum of houselessness like we were talking about earlier. Thank you, Elise. Appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, I did see it. I think there's a link in the chat now for folks to, to reference. When you think about houselessness and, and what we do here at Providence, can you talk a little bit about how houselessness affects patient care? Um, maybe we'll start with Father Chris. Now, let me just talk about it from something I know pretty intimately, and that was my previous work in Austin with people who were HIV positive or had AIDS. The simple thing is that people who are living either couch surfing, uh, living in their car or living on the street, often um, cannot keep their medication. Um, so for example, um, you notice that people who are living on the street um, have things stolen from them, that they're carrying all their belongings with them. If they lose a prescription that costs three or four or $5,000 and it's gone, they just won't take their medicine. And then the simple thing with that is that they will eventually show up in one of our hospitals. So how do we manage folks like that? In Providence Newburgh, we have people who, for example, um, are released from the hospital. And part of that release is to have a social worker or a physical therapist or a nurse check in with them. Well, if we can't find them, um, if they don't have a phone, if they don't have an address, and also if they don't have a safe place for us to visit them, it's difficult. I think one of the really exciting things that Elise and, and our outpatient medical group is doing is to acknowledge that sometimes the, the way that we set up to deliver medical care works perfectly well for most of us. But if you are experiencing houseless, it doesn't work at all. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you had your ID stolen, what's the first thing that you they ask you for, whether you go in for a lab draw, a doctor's visit, can I have your ID and your insurance card? So how do we make our systems more friendly? Um, in, the, in the case of Elise, I mean, their, the group is piloting a pro program where they bring their services, doctor and mental health services to the shelter, um, to our uh, shelter that's here in, the, the, uh, in Newburgh. But Elise, why don't you say more about how our systems are sometimes friendly or unfriendly to people who might be experiencing houselessness? Yeah, and I will acknowledge, I see that Renee Crank is on, um, which is so awesome. She's one of our Better Outcomes or Bridges um, outreach specialists and um, one on the front line really doing the work. And she just said that she has, um, her caseloads over 70% of clients experiencing some form of houselessness. So that really just does speak to um, the need that is within our community currently. Um, I would say, um, the first thing that always comes to mind, you know, I've shared this many times, but as I'm in recovery, and so a person in recovery, you think about, um, you know, those things, as a person in recovery, many people don't think about the things that impact you to get um, the kind of medical care that you need. And so um, I can only imagine, and from the um, personal connections that I have with those individuals, with individuals that are houseless, um, you know, a doctor trying to speak to them about their health condition is pro and set goals around that health condition. If you don't have somewhere to sleep, you're probably not going to be super um, top of mind of how you're going to go to a diabetes education class, for example, or how you're going to um, regularly find um, time to exercise or whatever the health goal may be. Um, so, you know, I, from interacting with both houseless individuals and then also our um, Bob team, just hearing the story and what um, a roof over someone's head, what that does for an individual, really opening, opening up additional space within their lives to engage in health goals um, is a huge, huge thing. Um, I will just share an example um, of how houselessness can impact someone's just medical life. Um, we have an individual that um, is just an amazing person um, and is currently houseless in the community and had to undergo surgery um, and really didn't have anywhere that this person could be released to recover from surgery. 
And so um, our um, shelter ended up being really the only option that this individual could do that. Um, and we were able to um, get five weeks of stay within a local hotel for this individual to recover. And even seeing his, outside of his surgery and him doing great and recovering, um, seeing him take initiative on other areas of his life and other um, medical um, things that need attention, just because he's had consistent five weeks at a hotel is, it's, it's life-changing. Um, and for me as a person, you know, there isn't more, for me, there isn't much more um, impactful work human to, human to human to see someone be able to have the opportunity to um, engage in pieces of their life that they most likely um, would not have been able to if they're just concerned about where they're going to sleep tonight. That's payback. That's the reward that you get for this work you do. I know you don't do this work alone. Uh, Father Chris, can you give us an idea of some of the organizations with which you partner to serve these uh, houselets? Sure. Um, we partner with uh, local benefactors in the community. Um, there are foundations and individuals who um, uh, participate with us. But larger, um, Elise mentioned um, YCAP, which is the Yam Hill Community Action Program, then nonprofits like Community Wellness Collective, um, Love Inc. There's a number of, of projects within Newburgh that um, work to try to help people. Um, YCAP is probably the largest, and then um, the health department um, located in Yam Hill County um, does quite a bit of work. And, some of this is just um, patching together funding for uh, motelling projects. So like they're in the middle of COVID, um, we, we worried as a community and the state and federal government worked together. What would happen if somebody were co had COVID and had nowhere else to, to shelter and to stay quarantined? So that was a program that stood up. And we're constantly in this flux. I think of one opportunity where Providence was a catalyst um, with some state and federal dollars, the local YCAP group um, and others. Um, and we were able to purchase a motel, a Motel 6 in McMinnville. It is currently being operated as a, a low barrier shelter, which means that we take people where they came. So if they have a pet or they're still um, uh, in their act, active there in, in, in their addiction, we take them. Um, that will eventually um, become 50 plus um, permanent supportive housing beds. Um, we are also um, very intent on doing that same thing in Newburgh, perhaps not buying a motel, but perhaps building from the ground up. And I can't <laughs> say too much uh, because uh, just a lot of irons in the fire, but Providence is an active player in that. And again, Mike, uh, that idea of us being big while we're still able to be small is so important. Um, we're able to draw on all the skills and resources that Providence as an uh, endeavor that exist in seven states um, with literally hundreds of thousands of caregivers and leaders. Um, but how do we um, make that look like Newburgh? How do we make that idea fit for our community? And so we're laser focused. Uh, Joe has been a great support. Um, our foundation and SAC board, our service advisory committee boards um, are very supportive of this idea. And Providence, um, actually it makes it part of our jobs uh, in a way um, to, to do this. And so um, that is, those are the partners that I can think of. Am I missing anyone, mm -hmm. Joe or Elise? Lutheran it? Family Services, I would say is another. That's big. right, yeah. So following up on that, uh, do you have future plans uh, for serving the needs of, of the houseless? I mean, things you are maybe dreaming about right now that aren't yet realized? Well, they're a little bit more than a dream, but they're not quite um, baked enough for me to say too much about it. So uh, I will tell you, we've been working on this for two years. Um, the project that was supposed to land here landed in McMinnville just because of, um, I think God's grace really, that was just where the opening was. That was where, and that's where the need was at the time. But all of those plans are being laser focused to Newburgh. And I hope to be able to tell you next year something more specific. We'll just keep our fingers crossed. And, mm -hmm. and for me, I'll keep praying about it. <laughs> Father Chris, you mentioned earlier um, one of our values of dignity um, and, and why this work is important to us as an organization. I wondered if you could share a little bit more about our values um, and why it draws us into this space. Sure. 
Well, uh, let me just say our mission statement. Um, I told you our vision, our vision is health for a better world, but our mission is um, that as expressions of God's healing love, witness through the ministry of Jesus, we're steadfast in serving all, especially those who are poor and vulnerable. So this notion that we are have a special focus on the poor and vulnerable comes from one of our five values. So our values are compassion, um, dignity, justice, excellence, and integrity. The value of dignity is really undergirds all of those. If you can, another way to say dignity is to say inherent worth and value. Um, I saw a lecture on this uh, a TED talk where a guy had a $20 bill. It should have been a $100 bill. It's a little bit old. And he took it and he raised, he raised it in the sky and said, who wants this? Really, I'll give it to you. And everybody said, I want it. He took it, crumpled it, stepped on it, put it on the ground, picked it up. Who wants it? it it's same thing. Tore it into bits. Who wants it? The idea is no matter what happens to us as human beings, um, no matter where we go, uh, no matter how the world or uh, ourselves sometimes step on us, we have an inherent worth and value that's worthy. Everybody is worthy of being treated with compassion, to be treated in a way that's excellent, to be treated in a way that's just and fair, that's treated in a way where uh, the integrity of who they are and what we see kind of line up. So that idea really translates the Sisters of Providence uh, have always seen their work to those who are marginalized. And you know, often we think of the obvious, people who are houseless, um, people who are migrants, et cetera. But there are moments where we are all, all vulnerable. Um, I heard an author, Brene Brown, say, we're all just one bad car accident or bad medical diagnosis away from being extremely vulnerable. And, and I think that that mindset kind of shapes how we, we set up our business models. It shapes what communities we go in. I know somewhere within the Providence St. Joseph um, uh, system, we have intentionally um, gone into markets that are um, less than profitable because we're needed there. Um, and there are moments where we move out of markets where others come in and can better fill those gaps. So it's really on focus of the patient and focus on the good of the whole. So, you know, this idea of the common good comes from the idea of dignity. Let's talk about the patient. <laughs> and I know, Elise, uh, you work with the staff in the hospital, uh, in the clinics. Um, how, does, uh, how do those values, I guess I'm getting at how does the rubber meet the road here? How do those values operate within, you know, care of individuals? Well, I, I'll just say that, um, you know, the mission and the values are, I think, the resounding theme as to why caregivers and providers choose and then also stay at Providence. And, um, you know, it's something that um, I, I can attest for myself, and I'm sure many people in Providence has kept me going during the pandemic. And um, there have been many, many um, hardships placed on caregivers and providers um, to keep up. Um, with current demands and then also, you know, what is really now crisis staffing um, while still um, putting the patient at the center of everything that they do. Um, and, you know, I would say that, you know, we talk a lot, a lot about being patient centric and what that looks like. Um, but my experience is really it, that being patient centric is really around the idea of human dignity and worth that Father Chris described. Um, and, I really actually can't imagine working at a different organization that didn't have those, those core values central to the way that we operate and really bringing us back to what our business models are and um, how, how we make really difficult, um, difficult decisions during um, what seems like an impossible time right now. Um, so I can just attest that from our frontline caregivers all the way up to our leaders like Joe, you know, that is the common thread that um, ties us together is really the belief in our core values. Well, I see if I were a patient, I'd sure want to be treated uh, according to those values. Absolutely.
Nicole. <laughs> Hi again, everyone. So we are just about out of time and I wanted to get to just a few of our audience questions we had today. Uh, one question was that you mentioned that the Community Wellness Collective started after some mental health crises at the Newburgh School District. Have you seen the mental health of the high school and the school district improve since then? Uh, me? I'll take sure, Ellie. <laughs> I mean... I can, I can only speak to the level of services that we provide and the interactions that I know that um, the people that I'm privileged enough to have relationships with um, interact with our youth on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I will say that um, similar to, you know, when we did this, so when we started doing social terms of health screening, it, it was a, it's been a very similar experience going into the Newburgh Public Schools um, and, you know, being present for me that, that is there. Once you come, once you come, once you go into a place, there will be, you will find the need, right? So um, I think that Newburgh is not different than other communities in the sense that youth are struggling with mental health and that the pandemic has had, has exacerbated that and placed um, huge enhanced need on mental health services and social services for, um, for youth. Um, we are super lucky to have um, been able to really expand the services that we can provide um, within Newburgh schools. And, you know, it is not Providence alone at Newburgh schools. It, you know, Lutheran, um, Lutheran uh, Family Services, um, HHS, uh, and then um, us as well, we are, we are working together um, to provide therapy visits, peer support visits for youth, um, but I would say that if I, I don't, I don't know if I could really say that it's decreased since we've been there, but we've been able to, to meet on that need now. I love that you pointed that out, Elise, is that this project um, has been many, many years. Um, and with the current climate that we have in schools between the extrins extrinsic factors that we can't control like the virus, but just all the stress of being alive in 2021, especially in Newburgh, and with the divisions and whatnot, but this idea that the community came together and passed a bond um, and gathered partners and entered into agreements. And we are just, I think, as Providence, honored to be part of that. Um, but again, these are one of those areas, as I said, when we started off, there's moments where Providence is a catalyst. There's moments where we um, are invited to participate or to do something. And then there's moments where we are just in our element doing what we do, which was provide mental health care or provide medical care. The wellness, the wellness, this is wellness centers in the school are really around um, well-being, which again is part of our Catholic vision, Catholic healthcare. This vision that people aren't meant um, to just subsist; they're meant to flourish. So, how can we help people flourish, especially young people? They're our next generation, for goodness' sake. So thanks for pointing all that out, Elise. I'm proud of our work there. Last thing I would say too, just is that um, what what I, where I think we've made huge progress is destigmatizing access to mental health care. Right. So in the last five years, seeing um, where youth and families were of accessing that care and then being comfortable saying, "Yes, I have depression. Yes, I have anxiety." Um, to where we are now is leaps and bounds um, where we want to be. And so my hope um, for the future of Newburgh is that we continue to rally around our youth that, um, that are struggling just like we're struggling. You know, all, all of us are struggling right now um, and that we empower them to access services rather than feeling like um, there's something wrong with someone that accesses mental health services. It is just one piece of holistic health care. That's great. Thank you both so much for answering that. Um, it looks like we probably have time for just one more question. And this is about a tiny home option for patients. The question is, I heard there was a tiny home option. Is oh, no. that somewhere patients can go? Oh, no, this is a hard, this is one that dagger to my heart. Um, so tiny homes have been a conversation in our community for a while now. There's um, a couple different 
um, individuals in our community that are experts in tiny homes, really incredible um, people of service in the Newburgh community. We have explored tiny homes in a, a number of different scenarios. The one that I'm sure people are refer this person is referring to um, is that we were in discussions about a tiny home village on the corner of 99 and Providence Drive. Um, but we have really been trying to think more long term about that space um, and utilizing it for something that could be, um, you know, there in 20 years, 50 years. Um, so that's where that stands right now. More to come, as Father Chris said. But um, what I will say, and a huge shout out to our friends at North Valley Friends Church, they have stood up a um, tiny home village and our, for our um, outreach specialist through our Bob team um, partners with North Valley Friends often to place um, patients that are houseless in that, um, in, within those um, homes they have on their, on their campus. So I, there's a lot of different initiatives going on within our community. You know, we are one of many people working on this. Um, but what I'm really proud of is that we have all stayed really connected um, to support one another and try to place each individual in the right um, environment for their specific needs. If I could just jump in one one other comment, um, I think part of our vision is again more holistic and tiny home villages is is, um, is a perfect spot for certain folks, but um, long term. I think the community at large um, and uh, our regional and state partners really want to see efforts that keep people permanently housed. So uh, if you put somebody in a shelter and then measure uh, how, how long they stay in that shelter and where they move, the goal for us is for people to flourish, for people to find stable long-term housing. And if the tiny homes meet that need in the intervening time, that's great. Providence wants to make its efforts around addressing the social determinants that put people in a state where they could be houseless. So that, that idea is that we need a lot of intervention, we need a lot of a, a team um, present, mental health, peers, others to support them. Um, uh, just think about when we've had really difficult situations in our own lives. You know, we've lost a house to a flood, lost a child, um, the way we got through for most of us is to think about the community and team that was supporting them. So we're trying to come alongside these folks and to be that for them. And Tiny Homes, we just decided strategically, that's why I was a little uh, ambiguous um, about where we might be, but we hope to build something, whether it's on our property or with partners that, that does just that. <laughs> Great. Those are our audience questions for today. Father Chris, Elise, thank you so much for joining us. Joe, Mike, thank you as always for being our gracious host for Mondays with Mike and Joe. At this time, I am going to welcome back Doug Kane, who is the Executive Director of Providence Newburgh Health Foundation. And I'll let him leave us with some final thoughts. Yeah, thank you, Elise and Father Chris, uh, for joining us today. And, and a big thank you for all of you joining us today as well. As a reminder, our next Mondays with Mike and Joe is scheduled for Monday, April 11th at 12 noon. We will be discussing Base Camp, which is our Providence Heart Institute's cardiac rehabilitation program, a wonderful program that is allowing us to keep quality and exceptional care close to home. We know it'll be a great conversation, so be sure to mark your calendar and tune in. If you would like more information regarding the Providence Newburgh Health Foundation and ways you can support our patients in need, visit our website at providencefoundations.org backslash Newburgh. That's providencefoundations.org backslash Newburgh. You can also call or email me. On the screen is my contact information. Also, if you have any other questions for Mike and Joe, let me know as well. We will be following up on questions not answered during the program via email. Thank you for joining us, and we look forward to you joining us again on Monday, April 11th.